Hello everyone, I'm Sula, and this is chapter 6 of my multi-part series, Sula's Complete Video Guide to Becoming an Amateur Astronomer, Chapter 6, Stargazing Tips. For the past few weeks I had planned to have a laser guided tour of the actual sky, but amateur astronomy being a weather dependent hobby, it was thwarted by bad weather. So instead I thought I'd have this chapter on stargazing tips. So if you're planning to go stargazing, my tips are number one, planning, number two, preparation, number three, observing. For planning, first of all, you need to know where you're going to be observing. Is it in your yard or do you have to go somewhere? If it's at your house or your yard or nearby, you need to check your local weather and make sure that it's going to be clear, or at least somewhat clear. If you're going somewhere else, you're going to have to check the weather in that location because it may not be the same as the weather where you are. I use weather.com, which I think is pretty reliable, and you can put multiple cities or places on it and check where you are and other places too. And it'll go for several hours into the next day even and tell you whether it's going to be cloudy. It doesn't tell you how much clouds though. So you need some other apps. One that I use is Astropheric. Not only does it tell you the cloud cover, it also tells you the seeing. Seeing is whether there is atmospheric turbulence. If there's bad seeing, even if there aren't clouds, it's going to impact how well you can see things in the sky. And it also tells you the visibility. Another good app is Ex Asteria. <laughs> um, and that app is updated every six hours. So it's uh, pretty precise and it, it incorporates three different uh, weather applications into it and so you can change from which one you like better but they all tell you the same information the cloud cover the visibility and the wind and the seeing and they also tell you sunset and sunrise and moonset and moonrise and phases of the moon if you're just going into your backyard or near your home you probably just need to walk out there and spend as long as you want and then walk back in. But if you have to travel somewhere, you need to plan. You need to find a place that's not light polluted and you can use lightpollutionmap.info. That'll show you some places that are not light polluted that you might want to travel to if they're not too far. And you need to know how long it'll take you to get there and how long to get back because stargazing is a late evening event. And so you need to plan for that Find a dark place, see how long it's going to take you to get there, and after that, check the weather for that location. Next, you need to prepare. If you plan to just do some naked eye observing, you probably don't need much more than to check your weather app, check the phases of the moon, and take your star chart or your planisphere, and you'll need a red headlamp to read your star chart. You'll want some warm clothing because even in spring it's going to be much cooler at night. So you'll need a beanie and a jacket. And you should take some kind of notebook or log book to record your observations and the conditions. And don't forget a pen. You might to also like to take a portable chair like this to sit on. So if you're out there a long time, you might get tired. And that's probably about all you need for naked eye observing. If you plan to do some binocular astronomy, then I would recommend that you take a magic cloth. It's okay to clean binoculars with them as long as they're clean. Make sure your optics are clean. And if you're going to use them handheld, that's probably about it. But if you're going to be out there a long time, you might want to think about using a tripod. And if you're going to do that, you should attach these pieces while it's still light out because it can be hard to get this attachment that attaches binoculars to a tripod in the dark because 
goes right here and you take this piece off and screw this into here and then you screw this in into the tripod. Like so and then it's ready to be attached to the tripod. And this is a pair of Vortex that I borrowed from my friend Katie. They're very lightweight and they have pretty good optics. These are Vortex Viper, 10 by 42. If you attach it to a tripod with a ball head, it's a little easier to get it up to the zenith. If you need to look at something at the zenith, and it's easier to move it around like this to comfortably look at things in the sky. But you can use a pan a handle also, and that will work okay. And then you might want to consider whether you want a chair too. And then you can tilt the tripod back while you're sitting in the chair. And this would give you hours of comfortable stargazing so that your arms don't get too tired. And sometimes you might want to stand up too. So whether you want to do some naked eye observing binocular astronomy, or you even already got your telescope, even though we hadn't gotten there yet, you're not quite ready yet. You did your first stage planning. You picked a place, you checked the weather, you got all your equipment ready, but now you need to do some secondary planning. Let's say you wanted to go out to Yosemite. You got your permit, you got your campground reservation, you showed up in the valley and it's light polluted and you said this won't do. So you drove out to Tioga Pass. You found a nice open meadow with a clear view of the whole sky. A great gray owls hooting softly in the distance. You're all ready. It's not a cloud in the sky, but the universe is vast and there are so many things to look at. What are you going to look at? You need to make a list of objects that you want to observe that evening. So you make your list and you pick out things that are visible for that time of year and you put that on your list and give yourself plenty of time. You should spend 15 minutes on each object because the longer you look at an object, the more details you're going to make out. And before you even start, just sit there for a while and let your eyes get dark adapted, at least 20 minutes and then start looking for the first thing on your list, find it, and then spend 15 minutes looking at it, take some observational notes, maybe even sketch it, and then you can move on to the next thing. And my last tip is have very low expectations. <laughs> have reasonable expectations about what you're going to see because with the naked eye, you're just looking for the constellations and the brightest stars and learn the sky. With binoculars, you're hoping to see some things, maybe some star clusters or galaxies, but you're not gonna see anything like those beautiful, colorful pictures you see on the internet or on Hubble's uh, books or NASA's website. You're not gonna see anything like that. You have to be realistic. If you look with binoculars, they're just going to be fuzzy patches. Even with the telescope, a lot of the time it's just a fuzzy ball. And that's fine. That's great because think about it. These objects are so incredibly far away and you're able to see them at all. That is just fascinating and incredible. And that's what gives you joy about looking at the universe. Don't have expectations of seeing something that you're not going to see and then being disappointed and dropping the hobby because that's not what it's about. It's about the thrill of the universe. You see this beat up old map, Deep Map 600 by Orion? Believe it or not, that's what I use to try to find things with my old daub. No wonder I can never find anything. You need a better star chart than this thing. I like it, but Okay, you got your coat, you got your beanie, you got your gloves. 
you got your binoculars, you have your sky atlas, your log book and pen, and a little chair. You're ready to go. You check light pollution map.info or darkskysite.org and you found a dark place, but you're not quite ready to head out. You decided to go to Yosemite. You got your camping reservation and your reservation to enter the park. It's reservation only now. And you set up your tent and you see that Yosemite Valley is way too light polluted and it won't do it all. So you drive out to Tioga Road. You find a nice open meadow with a clear view of the sky. There's not a cloud in the sky. Now what? That's what I mean by you need to have a plan because the universe is vast and there are lots of objects in it. So before you head out, you need to make a plan for what you want to look at. And there are some resources for that too. But first I have to take this hat and beanie off because I'm hot as hell. If you're just getting started and you're still learning the constellations and the brightest stars, this is an excellent beginner book. It's self-published by John Reed. And it's pretty basic, but it'll give you a list of things to look out throughout the seasons. And I would recommend that. Another excellent book I highly recommend is Turn Left at Orion. It has lots of objects to look at through the seasons with binoculars, small telescope, medium-sized telescope, or Dobsonian. And he even rates them on difficulty. That book does too. That's a great book, and I highly recommend it. And there's also Sue French's Deep Sky Wonders, and you can look in Sky and Telescope magazine each month. They make a list of, of um, objects to look at in articles. And also High Point Scientific will send you a email newsletter each month with top objects to look for. And another place, I don't even know how I got on their list, is something called Telescopius. And they list objects, but I don't like that one because they don't tell you the Messier number or sometimes they they just say what constellation it's in, but if you're just starting out you really want to know where it is. Uh, but that would at least give you a, a list and then you go to your star chart and you figure out where they are and whatever your list is. Maybe you just have a top 10 list of things. Make sure they're visible for the time of year that you're going out. But the best tip and my number one tip for stargazing is to have reasonable expectations. You're not going to go out and see colorful nebulae and galaxies with their spiral arms clearly defined. You're not going to see anything like that. You're not going to see colors at all. Maybe if you look at a double star and you resolve it, you can see that the two stars are different colors, but nebulae, star clusters, galaxies, no. They're just going to appear as dust balls or dusty smudges or patches, even with big telescopes. So have a reasonable expectation. You're just going to see a dust ball or a smudge. And you might be saying, well, Sula, what's, what's so thrilling about that? What's so thrilling about that is that these things are incredibly far away and that we can see them at all is amazing and thrilling. So take that with you when you go out and start your journey to becoming an amateur astronomer. Have reasonable expectations and be happy with whatever you see because it's unbelievable that you can see it at all. And speaking of dust balls, at the end of chapter five, I recommended that you go out with your binoculars and look for M3, a globular cluster in Canis Venatici. If you did go out and look for it, uh, you may not have been able to find it. It was maybe a little bit overly ambitious for binoculars, although you can see it with binoculars in a very dark place but better in a small telescope. But it is a globular cluster, and that is a small sphere of stars tightly bound by gravity. And globular clusters are incredibly old. In fact, M3 is thought to be 11 billion years old. And M3 is made up of over 500,000 stars, and it's 32,000 light years away. A light year is six trillion miles, so think about that, 32,000 times six trillion miles away is how far away that is. That's incredible that you could see it at all. 
In chapter two, I went over apparent magnitudes, that's how bright objects appear to us here on Earth, not their intrinsic brightness. And most people can see up to a sixth magnitude star, and the apparent brightness of M3, the globular cluster, is 6.2, so it's right at the limit of what you could see. And my directions were probably not that good. I said a little bit between al K, the last star in the handle of the Big Dipper, and Arcturus, the orangey, brightest star in spring, and the kite-shaped constellation Bootes. Uh, it's a little bit closer to Arcturus, about three and a half degrees between it and a beautiful double star, Cor Coroli and Canis Venatici. But you'd have to know where that is to find that. But anyway, use your star chart and star hop from Arcturus to find it. There are thought to be 150 globular clusters in the Milky Way, though they're not exactly sure. So I wanted to leave you with some other recommendations of things to look for in the spring. Some people consider M3 the second best globular cluster, with the best being M13. The Hercules Cluster, also known as the Keystone Cluster, because Hercules has that famous keystone that helps you find it in the sky, and it's higher up than Bootes. And in that square on one side is M13, which is a naked eye object if you're in a dark enough place. Though Hercules itself, the constellation is not very bright, but if you look in Hercules and you find it, you should be able to see M13, the Hercules cluster another globular cluster that's thought to be the finest globular cluster in the northern night sky. It was discovered by Edmund Haley in 1714. And by the way, these M, in case you don't know, most people probably know this, M stands for Messier. Charles Messier was an astronomer who was looking for comets and he was irritated by all these dust patches in the sky that were not comets, so he made a catalog of things that were not comets and they're haphazard, they're not in any kind of order, but there are 104 of them and they're uh, globular clusters, nebulae, galaxies, and uh, that's what M stands for. So M13 is Messier 13 and it's in Hercules and it's a globular cluster. But Messier didn't catalog that globular cluster until 1764. It's about a third of the way between Arcturus and a very bright star in spring and summer, Vega, in the constellation Lyra. And you should be able to find that with binoculars, even under suburban skies. It'll just look like a fuzzy patch. If you have a medium-sized telescope, you can resolve it into pinpoints of light. And if you have a large telescope, you can resolve it even further. And it's quite beautiful. It's, it's just stunning. I highly recommend it. And another good object to look for is M51, the famous Whirlpool Galaxy. It's uh, in Canis Venatici, but it's very close to Alcade, the last star in the handle of the Big Dipper. And it is a beautiful grand design spiral galaxy that's face on, meaning that if you have a big telescope, and I mean big, like my 12-inch Schmidt Cassegrain. <laughs> that was the only way I could resolve it into spiral arms. With binoculars, or your naked eye is just going to look like a fuzzy patch, but it's pretty easy to find, I think, if you find Alcade in the Big Dipper. It's about three and a half degrees southeast of Alcade. And in binoculars, it will just look like a fuzzy patch. Uh, in a small telescope, to me, first time I looked at it, it looked like two donuts stacked on top of each other with two eyeballs in it because the spiral galaxy has a companion underneath it, NGC uh, 5194. But if you have a big telescope, then you can resolve a lot more detail in it. But it's a naked eye object if you're in a dark enough place. So go find a dark sky site and go look for M51 because that's a fine object to look for. So with that, I'll conclude chapter six. 
my top tips for stargazing. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you can get out there with your binoculars or if you already got your telescope, your telescope and go out and enjoy the night sky. Dark skies forever. Sula signing off. Thank <laughs> you.